video series accompanies the Cisco Netacad IT Essentials 7.0 course. This video covers Chapter 3, Advanced Computer Hardware. In Chapter 3, we're going to look at booting the computer, configuring the BIOS and UEFI settings, electrical power, and we'll also look at advanced computer functionality, computer upgrades, and protecting the environment. 3.1, booting the computer. When a computer is booted, the basic input output system, or BIOS, you've probably heard the term BIOS, but that stands for basic input output system, that performs a hardware check on the main components of the computer. It checks um, to make sure everything's there that's supposed to be there. You know, it does it have a motherboard, does it have RAM, does it have a CPU, those types of checks. And that's called a power on self test or post test. Power on self test. If a device is malfunctioning, an error or a beep code alerts uh, will alert you. You'll get a series of beep codes. BIOS manufacturers use different beep codes, so there's no one type of codes between manufacturers. So, for example, if you're using an Asus, or it's going to have a different type of beep codes than another type of manufacturer. So, you want to get with the manufacturer website and look up what beep codes they're using for their motherboards and you can figure out what the codes mean. Um, one way to check that though is if you're um, if you want to check to make sure the post is working properly is not install the RAM. It's not going to hurt anything. Just boot the computer without the RAM in it and you'll get a series of beep codes from the computer and you can check those against the beep codes from the manufacturer to see if that is working properly. The BIOS and CMOS, all motherboards need a BIOS to operate the basic input op output system. Um, it's located on a ROM chip on the motherboard. It has a small program that controls communication between the operating system and the hardware. So it's a go-between between the OS and the hardware. Uh, along with the POST and BIOS, it also identifies which drives are available, which drives are bootable, how the memory is configured and when it can be used, how PCI Express and PCI expansion slots are configured, how SATA and USB ports are configured, and the motherboard power management features. The motherboard also saves the BIOS settings in a complementary metal oxide semiconductor or CMOS. Complementary metal oxide semiconductor CMOS or CMOS memory chip. We just know it as CMOS. Uh, when a computer boots up, the BIOS software reads the configured settings from the CMOS to determine how to configure the hardware, things like your uh, the date and time of the computer, uh, basic settings that need to be saved. The BIOS settings are retained by using a small battery. If that battery fails, important settings can be lost from your BIOS or from your CMOS. And if you are looking, when your computer boots up and you have the wrong date and time before it gets to your operating system, um, if you boot your into your BIOS and it's got the wrong date and time, maybe it's like a year old, that is an indicator that your battery is dead and it's not retaining your settings. The UEFI, UEFI, or Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, UEFI, that's newer computers. Uh, it provides additional features and addresses security issues with legacy BIOS systems. It can run on 32-bit and 64-bit systems. It supports larger boot drives and includes additional features such as a secure boot. And the secure boot allows the computer to boot to a specified operating system. You can lock it in. And it helps prevent root kits from taking over the system. The BIOS in UEFI security. Legacy BIOS supports some security features to protect the BIOS. However, the UEFI adds more security features which are better for you and everybody. Um, some common features, uh, passwords, those allow for different levels of access to the BIOS settings. And you can see down here at the below this chart down here, full access, you can change everything. Uh, limited access, you can only make certain changes like time and date. And then view only or no access. Drive encryption, a hard drive can be encrypted to prevent data theft. Low jack, uh, that's a security feature that allows the owner to locate, lock, and delete the device, even if it doesn't boot up into an operating system, even if somebody removes all the hard drives, it's something that's located on the actual motherboard or the, the device. The trusted platform module, or TPM, that's a chip designed to secure hardware by storing encrypted keys, digital certificates, passwords, and data. And then Secure Boot, that's a UEFI security standard that ensures compu the computer only boots to an OS that's trusted by the motherboard manufacturer. Updating the firmware or the BIOS, motherboard manufacturers may publish updated BIOS versions to provide enhancements to system stability, compatibility, and performance. Early computer BIOS information was contained in the ROM chips and to upgrade, the ROM chip had to be physically replaced. That no longer takes place. Usually what happens now is you download the BIOS 
or the UEFI firmware update. You put it onto a USB drive, you boot to your BIOS, then you tell it you want to go into BIOS update. It reads the file off the USB drive and updates um, the, the software. So modern BIOS chips, they are electronically erasable. They're programmable read-only or EEPROM. They can be upgraded with user without opening the computer case up. That's called flashing the BIOS. And to always be careful with up flashing the BIOS, you want to make sure that you don't lose power to the computer when that's happening. You want to make sure that you're not in an electrical storm uh, when that's happening. Um, you want to make sure that you get with the manufacturer's website, make sure that you're following the recommended installation procedures and that you're uh, following all the steps because it is important because you can really mess your motherboard up if you, um, you, can, you can what we call brick a motherboard if you uh, do that process wrong. Electrical power. Wattage and voltage are two of the things that you need to know in this course and in the um, uh, CompTIA course. Voltage is measured in volts or represented by a V. That's the measure of work required to move a charge. The current, or represented by an I, is measured in amperes. The measure of this amount of electrons moving through a circuit per second. Resistance, that's measured in ohms. That refers to the opposition to the flow of the current in a circuit. And P for power, that's measured in watts. The measure of work required to move electrons through a circuit multiplied by the number of electrons going through the circuit per second. And there's a basic equation known as Ohm's Law that expresses how voltage is equal to the current multiplied by the resistance, V equals IR. And an electrical system power is e equal to the voltage multiplied by the current or represented by P equals VI. Now you're not going to have to do any, uh, for this course, you're not going to have to do any calculations, but you do need to have a basic understanding of wattage, voltage, resistance, current, and, um, and the Ohm's Law. Now the power supply voltage settings, um, on the back of some power supplies, not all power supplies, but you'll see this little red switch right here. Um, that is a selector or a voltage selector switch. Uh, that lets you put it into either 110 volt, 110, 115, or 220, 230 voltage. Um, that's uh, called a dual voltage power supply. If the power supply does not have that switch, it's automatically detected by the power, by the power uh, supply and sets the correct voltage. And the correct voltage setting is determined by the country where the power supply is used. So depending on where you are in the United States, it's usually 110, 115. But I have seen on computers where this little switch gets um, slid over and it's in the 220 setting and it will not uh, power up properly. So that's one thing you want to check if you're having power problems. Fla power fluctuation types. Uh, when voltage in a computer is not accurate or steady, computer components might not operate correctly. So there's different terms that we know of uh, that we that we use. Uh, a blackout is when you have a complete loss of uh, power. A brownout is when you have a reduced voltage level. You you know you kind of kind of like goes down and comes back up. It's not a complete power off power outage, but it's uh, what we call a brownout and it can last for a, a few seconds. You can also have noise. That's interference from generators or lightning. You can also have spikes, and these are fairly dangerous. Uh, spikes are a sudden increase in the voltage that lasts for a short period of time. They exceed 100% of the normal voltage on the line. And then you can also have power surges. That's when you have a dramatic increase in voltage above the normal flow of electrical current. Now, protecting your device, you want to have some type of uninterruptible power supply. Um, you can do a basic surge protector. That helps protect against uh, surges and spikes, and those will look something like these right here. You'll have uh, some type of protector. You can even put your coax cable. You know, it'll have uh, it'll have uh, input and output for coax cable. Some of them even have uh, RJ45 connectors for LAN. Um, some of them will have that on there as well. Um, you might have ones that look like this right here. Those are uh, surge protectors. You can have for your USB chargers. You can have those as well. Then you move up to the UPSs. Those help protect against potential problems like uh, consistent quality of power for brownouts and blackouts. So they will they have a battery inside of them and they will run your computer for a certain amount of time depending upon your power needs. So for example, the one I have on my computer will run it for about 15 minutes if there's a complete power outage and that gives me time to shut my computer down if there is a power outage. You can also have standby power supply. That helps protect against potential electrical problems by providing a battery backup, and that's what most UPSs have. Uh, most UPSs that you look right here fall into both of these categories right here. Advanced computer functionality. When we look at the CPU architectures, a program 
is a sequence of stored instructions and a CPU executes those instructions by following a specific instruction set. And there's two different types that we're going to talk about in this course. There's two types and the first one is RISC and that's Reduced Instruction Set Computer. That uses a relatively small set of instructions. RISC chips are designed to execute the instructions very rapidly. And then you have CISC or Complex Instruction Set Computer. This architecture uses a broad set of instructions and results in fewer steps per operation. Now the CPU is executing one step of the program. The remaining instructions and the data are stored nearby in a, in a high speed memory called the cache or the cache. Uh, I've heard it pronounced both ways, cache or cache, uh, but, but it can only perform um, that particular core can only perform one step at a time. So, um, and most cores now are super fast and it'll, it, they're going to be calculating all of these. Um, if you've got multiple cores, they're all going to be calculating at the same time or offloading those. But while they're waiting to calculate, it will save that data or those instructions in the cache. Intel proper Intel processors use hyperthreading to enhance the performance of some of their CPUs. Uh, with hyperthreading, multiple pieces of code are executed simultaneous in the CPU, so a single CPU performs as though it were two. And AMD processors use hypertransport to enhance CPU performance. Hypertransport is a high-speed connection between the CPU and the Northbridge chip. And the power of a CPU is measured by the speed and the amount of data that it can process. The speed of a CPU is rated in cycles per second, such as millions of cycles per second, called megahertz megahertz are represented by capital M, capital H, and a lowercase z, or MHZ, or billions of cycles per second called gigahertz, GHZ. And the amount of data that a CPU can process at one time depends on the size of the front side bus, or FSB, front side bus. Overclocking is a technique used to make a processor work at a faster speed than its original specification. Overclocking is not recommended. It's not recommended to uh, to improve computer performance and can result in damage to the CPU. Um, now there are people that overclock their systems. I've overclocked my system. My current system, I've got some overclocking on it. Uh, the CPU manufacturer will set a recommendation of where that CPU is in its most stable range and they don't recommend you going over that, but you can make it go faster. It's going to generate more heat, so you need to have more cooling to your system. And if you overclock it, um, you just need to be careful that you're going to get unexpected results if you overclock it too far. Now the opposite of overclocking is throttling. That's a technique used when the processor runs at less than rated speed to conserve power or produce less heat. You see this a lot of times in laptops devices or mobile devices. The CPU gets throttled so it will cut back on power usage so it doesn't um, generate as much heat. It's, it also um, um, conserves power so if you get down to 10% um, battery on your phone or your laptop, the uh, computer will go into a CPU throttling so it uses less power um, so it can conserve the battery longer. Now you can also have CPU virtualization. That's a hardware feature that's supported by AMD and Intel that enables a single processor to act as multiple processors. And with virtualization, multiple operating systems can run in a parallel on their virtual machines as if they were running on a completely independent computer. So you can have a computer running on top of a computer. Now multi-core processors, they have two or more processors on the same integrated circuit. Integrating the processors on the same chip does allow for very fast connection between them. Multi-core processors execute instructions more quickly than a single core, and instructions can be distributed to all the processors at the same time. And RAM is also shared between the processors because the core resides on the same chip. And multi-core processors conserve power and produce less heat than multiple single core processors. That, that way they have perform better performance and efficiency. And these are some of the you know single core one core inside a single CPU, dual core, triple core, quad core, hex core, and octa core, which is eight cores. And they're working on adding even more cores inside of a single uh, CPU. By the time you watch this video, there may be more. Um, they're you know eight, sixteen, thirty-two. Um, you know I, I'm not I'm not I don't keep up real close with the uh, current. Another feature found in some CPUs is an integrated graphics processor unit or GPU. The GPU is a chip that performs rapid mathematical calculations required to render graphics. So a GPU can be integrated or dedicated. So you can have that a GPU on the motherboard. Some motherboards come with a integrated graphics card. Some of those have those car integrated graph integrated graphics. Some of those where you have to add your own graphics card independently. Integrated GPUs are often directly embedded 
on the CPU and it's dependent on the system RAM. The benefit of having an integrated GPU is the cost and less heat dissipation. And integrated GPUs are good at, at less complex tasks like watching videos and processing graphical documents, but they're not suited for intense gaming applications. So if you want to uh, have high-end gaming, you want to have uh, GPUs that are outside the CPU. Now, when we look at cooling mechanisms, we can have case fans. You can have you know case fans that are in your system. You can have lights. You can have all kinds of um, uh, fancy. You can have different sizes depending upon where um, it is in the case. A case fan is used to increase the airflow in the computer, and you want to be careful about when you add fans about the airflow going through a case fan. You don't want to inhibit. You don't want to have all your fans going into the computer. You want to have some fans blowing out and some fans go, pulling in. And you want to make sure that you're getting the proper airflow through the case. Most case manufacturers are going to give you a proper um, instructions on how to make the case flow work properly. Now the, C the CPU heat sink, that's a heat sink that has a large surface with metal fins. In order to draw heat away from the CPU, your CPU will set down here and the heat is generated. There is a connection. You'll have thermal paste between your CPU and the um, sink and the heat will rise up these fins here and it will get dissipated off and um, so it will keep the CPU cooler. A thermal compound is placed between the heat sink and the CPU to increase the efficiency of the heat transfer. You want to make sure that when you are putting your heat sinks on that if it had some type of plastic case or plastic coating on top of the, uh, it's usually a copper um, little um, little uh, plate on the bottom of your heat sink and you want to make sure that you've removed any plastic off there. You also want to make sure that you make sure that uh, the, the thermal compound is spread properly uh, between the heat sink and the CPU. And a CPU without a heat sink uh, is known as passive cooling. Or um, a CPU heat sink without a fan is known as passive cooling. Most computers are going to have some type of fan that sets on top of the heat sink and draws air across it, either down or draws it away. Um, and then it, it, that way the air will get drawn in here and then drawn up and out. And some do blow down across and then out. It just depends on the uh, heat sink and the fan. The CPU fan, uh, it's a common to install a fan on top of the heat sink. So this one's a fairly large one here. So you have a little copper that would set on top of the CPU. This heat would come up and then you would, uh, this one's got a fan inside of it right here. So it's drawing air in and then out of the system. So it draws it across there and across there, just much like a little radiator. And that is called active cooling. The graphics card cooling system usually is going to have some type of fan on it. Most newer graphics cards do. They have some type of fan on them. And that's going to draw air usually in here and then out the back side of the GPU. And then you have water cooling systems. Water cooling, uh, there's a metal plate that covers the CPU. And it's an enclosed system. And the water gets moved from a cooling area, usually a radiator. And there's a pump that pumps air, pumps some type of uh, liquid. Uh, it's not necessarily water, um, it's, but it does uh, pump um, a type of water. Usually it's, it's heavier than water. Sometimes it's got extra chemicals added into it, uh, but it helps um, disperse the heat into the air, and then the water is recirculated. RAID, or Redundant Array of Independent Disk, or RAID technology. RAID provides a way to store data across multiple storage devices for availability, reliability, capacity, and redundancy. And these are some of the terms you need to know for this course is how RAID stores data on various disks. You can have striping that enables data to be distributed across multiple drives with a significant performance increase. However, the failure of a single drive means that all the data is lost. You have mirroring. That means the that stores duplicate data on one or more drives and provides redundancy so that the failure of a drive does not cause the loss of data. So you're going to have multiple drives, usually three to five drives or more. And if one drive fails, the data is still there. You have a term called parity that provides basic error checking and fault tolerance by storing checksums to separately uh, check on data and enables the reconstruction of the lost data without sacrificing speed and capacity. And then you have double parity that provides fault tolerance for up to two fail drives. There are se several different types of RAID levels. Um, the use of mirroring, striping, and parity is going to determine which RAID level you're using. So higher levels of RAID, such as RAID 5 or 6, use striping and parity in combination to provide speed and create large volumes. And RAID levels higher than 10 combine lower RAID levels. 
So raid level zero is just a minimum number of drives. You have to have at least two drives that just uses striping, but that gives you performance and capacity, but all data is lost if one drive fails. And then raid level one, you have the mirroring, raid level five, raid level six, that's striping and double parity. Same as RAID 5, but you um, it can tolerate the loss of up to two drives. That's if you need to have even more redundancy. And it does take time to rebuild the array if one of the more drives fails. Now, you may come across legacy ports, and you do need to know these for this course. You're going to have a, a serial is the first one. That's what this looks like right here. You have your little screw, the, the pins that get screwed in here. And then you have your uh, post there that plug into the other side. It'll, look, it'll almost look like this side right here. If you look at this, what I'm pointing at right there, it's just the opposite side of the plug-in that goes in for the serial. It's used for connecting peripherals such as printers, scanners, modems. And yes, modems used to be connected externally. Parallel, used for connecting various uh, devices, commonly printers. Uh, this is the this pink one that you see up here. That was a parallel, a little bit larger, but it was the same concept, but the, it was flipped around. The connector that gets plugged in actually had these posts that pushed down inside there. You also had gaming for connecting a joystick input. PS2, and this is not the gaming console, it was PS slash 2. Um, that was used for connecting a keyboard and a mouse. That's what we see right here. This is the PS2. That was purple for keyboard and green for mouse. And you would plug in the little device here and you had to make sure that this post here. Now you could swap them out. They could, you could get them backwards. And I had had, I have done that in the, in the past when I've plugged these in wrong. That's why they color coded them so that you would know which one goes where. And then you have audio ports. Now audio ports are usually still around on most uh, modern computers and mo modern motherboards. Uh, but they're analog ports. They're use, used for connecting stereo systems, microphones, and speakers. And you also have um, your digital but it's just depending, you know, your output, your input. You have VGA. Um, that's an analog port. And it's still used. Some some devices still have VGA on them. There are some that you st will come across. DVI is more common that you'll, you're going to see commonly. Um, it's DVI analog, DVI digital, or DVI integrated. And you do need to know these different standards on the CompTIA exam. You're going to see these um, three, uh, DVI-A, DVI-D, and DVI-I. You're going to need to know the difference between those. And that's what this one looks like right here. HDMI, that carries the same video and audio. So you do get audio and digital, or vi video and audio on the same one for HDMI, which is nice. And then you have DisplayPort. That's designed to replace both DVI and VGI for computer monitors while including high bandwidth video and audio signals. And that'll, that'll look like right there. And you'll know the little cutout on the side there, so you can only plug it in one direction. USB cables and connectors. So USB has evolved from 1.0, 3.0, now up to 3.2. You have Type A. That's a typical rectangular connector found on almost all desktop and laptop computers. That's this one right here. Mini USB. You don't see these around very much. Most devices don't have the mini USB anymore. But then you have micro USB, which these are more common here, but they're falling out of favor with USB-C now. USB-C or type A. This is type B here. This is the type B, which are common a lot of times on external hard drives or printers. You'll see those. And then the most common type that you're seeing now is type C. This one right here. It doesn't matter which way you plug it in, which it's that that's always been a struggle to know which side to which way to plug in a USB. Well, USB type C solved that. There's four rounded corners. It's the newest. Um, as of 2021, 2020, um, it's a multi-purpose cable. You can attach all types of devices with it. And then you have your lightning cable. Uh, that's uh, proprietary to Apple. That's for Apple mobile devices, such as iPhones, iPads, and iPods. You have SATA cables, SATA, S-A-T-A. Uh, one end plugs into a SATA port on the motherboard, and the other plugs into the back of an in inter internal storage device. I almost can't say that properly. Internal storage device. And the SATA cable does not provide power. So a SATA power cable is needed in addition to the power internal. So you have your SATA cable, this connector right here, and then you would have a SATA power. And now we have eSATA cables. That is used to connect external SATA drives and it's, it's a keyed connector. That's external. And then you have an eSATA adapter. You can put this card in your computer. So if you want to connect eSATA. Now, when we look at cables and connectors, a twisted pair cable, and we're going to cover this a little bit more in the networking chapter, but the twisted pair is used in Ethernet networks and older telephone networks. When we talk about twisted pair, you have two different types. You have unshielded twisted pair 
and shielded twisted pair. Unshielded twisted pair is the most common and it just means that uh, it uses a color-coded insulated copper wires but it doesn't have any type of shielding around these wires here. A shielded twisted pair uses color-coded insulated copper wires but it includes foil or braiding as well. So you'll have some type of uh, foil that lays in, you'll have the plastic sheeting and then you'll have some type of foil or metal inside there and then you'll have your wires and that protects from EMI or electronic um, magnetic interference and again we'll cover this a lot more in uh, the networking chapter. You have RJ45. Each end of the UTP cable must be terminated with an RJ45 connector so it can be plugged into an Ethernet port. That's what this looks like right here. And then you have RJ11 which is older telephone networks that used a four wire and that's terminated with an RJ11 connector and it'll look a little bit smaller. Coax cable construction. Coax cable usually used for um, video. Um, it's, in, it's, got an, it's got your main copper wire here. You've got an insulated sheathing and you've got your braided for protection for uh, interference. And then you usually have a plastic coating out there. And you have RJ6. That's a heavy gauge cable with insulation and shielding for high bandwidth, high frequency applications, usually internet, cable TV, satellite TV. You see this a lot of times when you put in cable internet or cable uh, to a house or uh, a business, they're, they're going to be using RJ6. RJ59 is a thinner cable similar to RJ6, but it's used for low bandwidth and low frequency application, applications like analog video or CCTV. And then you have BNC. Um, it's an older connector. It's used with digital or analog audio video. You usually aren't going to see these in the workplace or in anywhere, really. I worked with them back in the 90s. Um, they were, um, you would plug these in and then you would twist this little cap here to make sure it didn't pop off. You had SCSI, Small Computer Systems Interface. It's a standard for connecting peripheral and storage devices in a daisy chain format. You had external SCSI cables. Those were used for connecting older devices such as scanners and printers. You're not going to see these in use very much, but you may come across a business um, that has may still be using these. Um, internal SCSI cables, they were common for connecting internal hard drives with 50 pins arranged in two rows attached to a ribbon cable. These were early on that allowed you to daisy chain hard drives so you could get uh, more computer, more drives inside of a um, device. Usually you saw these in servers. And then you had IDE cables. Uh, they were visually simil similar to the internal cable, but they were commonly with three 40 pin connectors. One connector connects to the IDE port and the other connected to the drive. You're usually going to see a red line down one side and that's the one pin. And then you'll have a color coding depending on where you plug it in, usually the motherboard here and the device there, or the motherboard and the device depending upon. Uh, you could usually put them in both ways. And one would plug into the motherboard and you could put up to two devices on the same ribbon cable. And you're usually not going to see these except in older computers, late 90s, 2000s uh, computers. You may still see them around somewhere, but um, uh, for newer computers, you're not going to see these. Now, when we talk about monitor characteristics, there's different types of computer monitors available. Um, they are going to vary by size, quality, clarity, brightness, depending upon the model. Um, a lot of different uh, things go into a, mo a monitor. But the most basic are the screen size. That's the diagonal measurement of the screen. That's the top left to the bottom right. It's not the top to bottom. It's the diagonal. Then you're going to have resolution. It's measured by the number of horizontal and vertical pixels. For example, a 1920 by 1080 or 1080p. That means it has 1920, 1920 pixels and 10,000 or 1080 vertical pixels. Then you have monitor resolution. That relates to the amount of information that can be displayed on a screen. Your native resolution that identifies the best monitor resolution for a specific monitor. Native mode that term describes when the image sent to the monitor by the video adapter card matches the native resolution of the monitor and then connectivity. Older monitors used VGI and DVI while newer monitors support HDMI and DisplayPort. Some other terms that you're going to need for monitors. Pixel, that's a tiny dot capable of displaying red, green, and blue. Dot pitch is the distance between pixels on a screen. Brightness is your luminance of the monitor measured in candelas per square meter. Contrast ratio, that's the measurement of how to white and how black a monitor can get. Aspect ratio, that's the horizontal to vertical measurement of the viewing area of the monitor. Refresh rate, the amount of seconds for an image to be rebuilt, measured in hertz. Response time, the amount of time in a pixel, or the amount of time for a pixel to change properties. Interlaced, creates an image by scanning the screens two times, odd lines and then even lines. And then non-interlaced creates an image by scanning the screen one line at a time from top to bottom. 
On our display standards, you have CGA or color graphics adapters. You're not usually not going to come across these anymore. I've, I've not seen any of these in the last 15 years, uh, but that was 320 by 200 resolution. VGA is 640 by 480. SVGA or Super Video Graphics Array is 800 by 600. HD is 720p, high definition. FHD is known as 1080p. QHD or Quad High Definition is known as 1440. And then Ultra High Definition is known as 4K. And that's 30, 3840 by 2160. Now, most setups that you're going to see are going to use some type of multiple monitor or they're going to plug in some type of laptop and have multiple monitors. But monitors can increase your visual desktop area and improve productivity. Added monitors enable to, to enable you to expand the size of the monitor um, or duplicate the desktop so you can view additional windows at the same time. Now, many computers do have built-in support for multiple, multiple monitors. And to connect multiple monitors, you just need to make sure that your computer has multiple monitors set up on it, get the right cables, and plug everything in, and then work with the operating system to be able to display multiple. Computer configuration. When you do a motherboard upgrade, computers do need periodic upgrades for various reasons. Either a user requirement changes, um, upgraded software packages require new hardware, or new hardware offers enhanced performance. If you upgrade or replace a motherboard, consider that you might need to replace other components like the CPU, the heat sink, the fan assembly, maybe the RAM if the RAM doesn't match with the new with the new motherboard. So a new motherboard also has to fit into the old computer case and this power supply must support it. Now when you're upgrading a motherboard, um, I'm not going to walk through these in detail, but you're going to, you know, step one, you're going to record how the how the power supply, case fans, case buttons attached to the old motherboard. I usually take a picture. I take my mobile phone and take a picture of the setup. You disconnect the cables from the old motherboard, disconnect and remove the expansion cards, record the old motherboard, uh, how, how it was secured in the case. Make sure that you make note of where the screws were. Then you remove the old motherboard, identify where all the connectors are, such as power, SATA, on the new motherboard. Replace the old I.O. shield on the back with the new I.O. shield. Insert and secure the motherboard into the case. Connect the power supply, all the other required cables. And then after the new motherboard is in place, the cables are connected, install and secure the expansion cards, you boot up to your BIOS and you're good to go. Now when you do a CPU upgrade, one way that you can increase the power of a computer is to increase the CPU. The new CPU might require different heat sink and fan assembly, so you want to check on that uh, to make sure that you're getting proper cooling. And the assembly must physically fit the CPU and be compatible with the CPU socket and the case. Um, it all also needs to be adequate to remove the heat of the faster CPU by installing additional case fans, or you might need to be, do that. And you also want to make sure that you apply thermal paste between the new CPU and the heat sink and the fan assembly. Otherwise, you're going to have a bad time. And you're going to put the, you know, you're going to put your chip in. You're going to put your thermal paste here. Make sure it's applied properly. There's lots of videos on the internet on showing you how to do that. And then um, you have a good connection. You can upgrade your storage devices. Instead of purchasing new computers um, to get more speed, uh, you might add more storage space. So you might do external. So you want to look at different reasons for um, additional hard drive space, increased storage, increased hard drive speed, installing a second operating system, storing the system swap file, providing fault tolerance or backing up the original drive. So all you're going to do is you're going to place the hard drive in an empty slot, tighten the screws, connect the drive, and attach the power cable. So if this is a this is a five and a quarter here that they're going to put in, they're going to uh, put it in the right slot attach the power cables, boot it up, and then work with your operating system to get it configured. Now, when you upgrade your peripherals, those uh, sometimes need to be upgraded, usually more often than the main components of your computer. Uh, but you want to check uh, your keyboard if you have to change the keyboard out of the mouse uh, to maybe a more ergonomic design, or maybe their user wants to have lights on their keyboard, or they want to upgrade their mouse. Uh, you can reconfigure the keyboard to accommodate a special task, such as typing in a second language, uh, or accommodate users with disabilities. Now, when you upgrade your power supply, um, it's most likely going to change because you've added upgraded a CPU or you need more power or you've added more device, you've added more things into your case and you need more power for it. So if you upgrade your power supply, you want to make sure that you calculate properly that you are, are putting enough power supply in or that you're putting the correct one in. So you can search for power supply wattage calculators to make sure that your power supply is the new one is going to give you enough power. 
A couple of terms that you need to know for this course there, we have thick clients. Those are some call, sometimes called fat clients, but they're thick clients. Uh, those are standard computers with their own operating system. If you have a desktop computer, at, you know, that you're looking at this uh, video with, um, you've got a thick client um, and they have, they're standalone. They do not require a network connection to operate uh, as all the processing is performed locally. That's how you know what a thick client is. It's everything's performed locally. A thin client is typically a low-end network computer that relies on remote servers to perform all the data processing. Thin clients do require a network connection to a server, usually um, accessing um, a web browser, and it doesn't necessarily need to be connected to the internet, just a network connection. And typically clients do, do not have any internal storage and have very little lo local resources. So they're not going to have a hard drive, they're going to have a little, small little processor, and everything is basically you're looking at, it, it's, it works like a browser. It's a little browser client, or what I call a browser client. And so you're going to connect to a server and do everything off the server. A NAS, or a network attached storage device, um, those are uh, servers that are connected to a network that provide file level data storage to clients. Um, sometimes the device can offer additional functionality such as media streaming, network services, automated backup functions, or website hosting. And last, we're going to look at protecting the environment. One of the things that you don't want to do is just throw devices into the common trash. You want to make sure that you have safe disposal methods. So the proper disposal of recycling hazardous computer components, it is a global issue. You, just don't, you don't want this stuff just thrown in the landfill somewhere. You want to make sure that you're following local regulations that govern how to dispose of specific items. There are organizations um, that violate the regulations and they can be fined for and have a lot of expenses with, that come with that. So you want to make sure that things like batteries, toner kits, cartridges, developers, chemical solvents, aerosol cans, cell phones, tablets, things like that, uh, they do have a lot of metal in these devices and you want to make sure that you're disposing of those properly. So make sure that you get with your local authorities um, to find out where to dispose of these devices um, in a proper way. You're also going to have safety data sheets or SDSs. Those were formerly known as material safety and data sheets or MSDSs. Now they're known as SDSs. Uh, that's a fact sheet that summarizes information about the material, including hazardous ingredients that can affect personal health, fire hazards, and first aid requirements. The SDS contains a chemical reactivity and compatibility information, and it also includes protective measures for safe handling, storage of materials, spill leaks, and disposal procedures. So to determine if a material is classified as hazardous, consult the manufacturer's SDS, which is in the U.S. is required by OSHA when the material is transferred to a new owner. And the SDS explains how to dispose of potentially hazardous materials in the safest manner.